Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Lots of news, respiratory viruses in the news. So first of all, uh, there is a brand new uh, variant, that, uh, JN.1, that is emerging. We'll talk about that because it's very, very interesting. It's the most rapidly growing variant uh, around. Uh, there was another paper, uh, once again, documenting that COVID-19 is associated with uh, high risk to uh, preterm uh, births and that the vaccines are very effective at preventing that. So once again, if you're pregnant, get vaccinated. Uh, flu is, we're in the middle of the flu season. There's been over 5 million people in the United States who've been infected and close to 55,000 hospi uh, hospitalizations and 4,600 deaths. Uh, in addition, people may not be aware of, there's a giant avian flu outbreak. Uh, and that virus has sped to over 106 uh, commercial flocks in 23 states. Uh, the number of birds lost to the avian flu is 72 million so far, with Iowa and Ohio being the most impacted states. Uh, this is also in Canada. So there have been 67 commercial poultry operations with 10 million birds lost. So uh, in general, with uh, the avian flu that's in, the, in poultry, it comes from migratory waterfowl that infect them. And as of now, there's no real concern about uh, problems with humans. If you look at uh, the overall respiratory disease, we're in the middle of the <laughs> classic December peaks in, in respiratory viruses. And you can see mostly now it's RSV and flu, but there's beginning to be a little bit of an uptick in COVID. And you can see that by looking at COVID hospitalizations. They were, they, they were coming down, but as you can see, there's been an uptick in hospitalizations. And mostly it's in the uh, people over the age of 70. Uh, if you look at the wastewater data, very interesting. Uh, it was around uh, in 49% of the wastewater sites were reporting either 100 or 200% increase. It's now up to 57%. And what, uh, this is kind of amazing to me. Uh, if you look at where this is happening, it is really highly concentrated in the Midwest and definitely in the northern states. Uh, very little relative for SARS in the south. And this is sort of classic winter virus behavior. When, when it's colder and people move inside, they're more likely to transmit it to each other. But what I don't get, just in contrast, if you look at flu, it's mostly in the southern states. And in general, flu is it's just like this uh, SARS. It usually starts in the northern states. I think the reason for this, it's hard to know with, with SARS, Almost everybody in the United States has either been infected or vaccinated, and so I think there's a lot of resistance, and so it's behaving based on the, the dynamics of whether we're close together or not. I think with flu, it really reflects the fact that the vaccination rate in the South is so much lower. Otherwise, I can't explain it. I don't know. Doesn't make any sense, but I think, it, I think that's the reason. Uh, here in Houston, we're doing okay. Uh, we're higher than we were la uh, two weeks ago, but not much. 160% of the viral load that was reported in July of 2020. And then this is the Texas data where you can see very nicely big increase in influenza, not so much of an increase in SARS. Now, I mentioned the big news in SARS, and this is, to me, kind of... Um, Pretty dramatic. We have not had much drama in the SARS world for you know a while now, but the most rapidly growing variant is this JN1. Now, if you'll recall, we talked about BA 2.86 in August. That was that weird uh, variant that it was very highly changed, many many mutations, uh, and, and we were all concerned. WHO was very concerned about it because it had so much change is a little bit like Omicron when it first appeared. Very, you remember that was a big changes in, in, uh, in probably a single patient in South Africa. We didn't really know what the source was, but this was mostly in Europe, a lot of changes, and it was in the United States, but it really didn't, it didn't spread much. We kept following it, didn't spread much. But if you look at what's going on now, in just two months, this was, November, this was October, you don't see any purple, November and December, and it is now the second most common uh, other than JV1, I mean uh, HV1, and it's 21% of the variants. Now, why am I concerned? Well, this was BA 2.86, uh, and, you know, it came off of the BA2 strain, 
Remember, our vaccine is again XBB. It didn't do much as BA 2.86, but one mutation, one single mutation to JN1, and now it's way, you know, <laughs> way more infectious or something. So that's a concern because I think this will clearly dominate all the variants. It will grow rapidly, and it might be behind this increase in, in hospitalizations with, um, with SARS. So as I mentioned, you know, there was a huge number of mutations in the BA 2.86. There's only one single change to make it JN1. It was first detected in the United States in September of 2023, and by the, uh, you know, it, it really has dramatically become the second um, most common variant, but I'm sure it's going to overtake HV1. Right now, we don't have any indication that there's an increase in severity, but the mere fact that it's outcompeting HV1 means it's either because of immune differences or because it's more infectious. I mean, that's pretty much, you know, either we're not recognizing it because it's so different uh, or uh, it's just more infectious. We don't know exactly why. Uh, the, we expect that the vaccine to XBB will be effective. If you look at that tree, yeah, it's different, pretty far away from XBB, but it's a lot closer than the original vaccine. So the, the variants, uh, the current uh, booster should be effective. Not as effective as if it was exactly to that right match, but it's another reason you should make sure you're up to date on your vaccines. I think next year, based on what happens, we'll probably have a different sequence, maybe closer to the, to the um, J, JN1. Uh, in addition, the uh, test should work, so your, your testing uh, should be fine, and the currently available drugs uh, should also be uh, uh, totally effective against this. But we just don't know right now whether or not JN1 is the driving force behind hospitalization increases, but my guess is it is. Well, let's talk a little bit about seasonal flu. Uh, it's certainly on the increase. Uh, the number of weekly hospitalizations has gone up. Um, it's still mostly 80% uh, influenza A, 20% influenza B. And I just remind everybody, anyone over, the, uh, over six months of age should be getting uh, a flu vaccine and the uh, prescriptions uh, antiviral drugs are, are, should be pr perfectly effective. You can see hospitalizations are going up for flu. Uh, this, is, this is the testing. These are A and influenza B. And if you do the subtyping, mostly it's H1, N1, a little bit of H3, N2. That's the influenza A and B victoria strains. No Yamagata strain around. Now, I wanted to show you this because this, to me, also explains. Remember, we, we were talking about the big outbreak in China, a lot of hospitalizations for pneumonia. Well, this is uh, from the CDC, pneumonia and influenza mor mortality. And you can see in 2022, right after we sort of stopped uh, having, you know, public health measures, we had this huge uh, impact, I increase in mortality and hospitalizations due to influenza. Well, that's what's going on in China. You can see in 20, this year, 23, it's high, but nowhere near as high as it was immediately after the, the sort of relaxing of, of uh, public health measures. Just again, RSV is up. Just, you know, it's, it's, it's respiratory virus season, so it's going on. Now, I want to mention two kind of cool papers. One in particular, this is an amazing, uh, it's called the COVID moonshot. And this is, uh, was a, f uh, a fully open science, patent-free drug discovery campaign to identify, synthesize, and test inhibitors against the protease, SARS-CoV-2 protease. And what they did was they started with a fragment-based screen, which is a you know, bunch of fragmented chemicals. We have that here. Uh, we, they took a number of uh, potential designs. They crowdsourced it from volunteers uh, and picked a bunch of design approaches that the volunteers came up with. Then they had a bunch of very experienced computational people take a look at it. Uh, and they did a open source medicinal chemistry uh, process. So eventually the project produced 18,000 compound designs, 2,400 synthesized compounds, uh, 490 ligand bound x-ray structures, 22,000 free energy calculations. I mean, it was really kind of, kind of amazing. This is all open source. And the recently improved antiviral, and I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but Ensel Telvir was identified as one of the candidates and is currently in a clinical trial. 
So that's the first time it's just completely open source, patent free. Uh, it's an interesting concept, and that was published in Science. But you know, maybe for future drug development, something we do. And then there's one other really interesting study I wanted to mention uh, that came out of Germany, and we've you know wondered why is it that the kids didn't seem to have as you know m much of a, a disease as adults. And we talked, we had a couple of papers that showed the receptor for the virus was lower in number until you became an, ad uh, an adolescent. So the ACE2 receptor is not very dense. But here's another one from that suggests that children are colonized with more immune cells in their in their upper airway, and that the, these immune cells produce more infl inflammatory cytokines and are able to deal with viruses, particularly like this in a non-specific way, better than adults. So, you know, it's interesting that the, the science around why kids did seem to do better than adults is coming out. So I end up, want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, I want to c congratulate Dr. B. John uh, Najafi, Professor of Surgery, Surgery, who has been appointed a Federal Advisory Committee member of the Department of Veterans Affairs Subcommittee on Chronic Medical Conditions and Aging. Uh, this is important. He'll provide insights and advice to research programs to the VA sent, uh, uh, research uh, programs, which is great. And it's the focus on what he's doing is on promoting functional independence, enhancing the quality of life for impaired and disabled veterans. I uh, also want to congratulate Dr. Richard Strax, Professor of Radiology. He received the 2024 Texas Radiology Society Gold Medal for his outstanding service to radiologists and radiologists in Texas. Uh, it's awarded for outstanding meritorious achievements and contributions that reflect credit upon radiology in Texas. And then finally, of course, hold your, hold your horses, get excited. The ca annual calendar for Baylor is coming out. It has a number of uh, faculty and uh, slightly clad uh, firemen out. No, no, that's the wrong calendar. I'm sorry. It has, great, it has artwork from various uh, people who contributed. My favorite, of course, is my own photograph, which let me find that here, which is, of course, gorgeous, my own photograph. But <laughs> there's another one. There's a great example of what a knockout mouse does. There are three mice working on, actually four mice working on a gene to knock out a gene. This is, I love this. Anyway, calendar is awesome. And you can get it by writing president at bcm.edu. We will send you at least one calendar. Anyway, have a great weekend. I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>